All right, so here in 12.2, we're going to be taking a look at um, characterizing and visualizing how we, how we visualize DNA, how we visualize RNA, and how we visualize proteins um, from different cells. Um, so first here at the beginning of the, the chapter, it talks about protein signatures. So this is an example of how we can identify an organism based on its proteins. And this is also specific to kind of different cellular responses and, and what's happening in its environment. <clears throat> so protein signatures are um, different amounts of proteins, so expression levels of specific arrays of proteins, meaning that if we put a particular cell in an environment, um, some sort of environmental factor, say we add a chemical um, to a solution, or say we add a stressor, so maybe we put it in a higher temperature than it normally likes or a lower temperature than it normally likes, then we can actually see its cellular response. And we can see its cellular response based on the proteins that it produces. So thinking back to its an organism's phenotype, of course the DNA will stay the same, but if we adjust the environmental factors and the stressors, then we can see what types of proteins are going to be produced, what are expressed, and that can help us to reveal the identity of an organism. So, for example, maybe if we um, take an organism and we put it in an environment that has lactose, well, some things are going to thrive in lactose and some things are not going to be able to use lactose. Um, and so maybe what we can do is we can see if enzymes to break down lactose are produced, if it's put in an environment with lactose. Um, of course, it might not grow in that case, and that's something that we can look at separately. Um, but we can take a look at what types of proteins are produced to identify an organism that we know produces those. We also can take a look at how a cell responds during disease. Um, so we can adjust the environmental factors and take a look at the cells. And this is more specific to something like a eukaryotic cell, for example. If we can take a eukaryotic cell and put it in a particular environment or an environmental factor, so like putting carcinogens there, and we can see what happens. Um, and we can take a look at the proteins that are made. And by looking at the proteins, we can determine what's going on with that organism or with that particular cell. So first we're going to take a look at some kind of simple ways to identify sections of DNA. And one way to do that is through a DNA probe. <clears throat> so we're going to look at a couple of different nucleic acid probing techniques, and this is one of them. So a DNA probe is where we are going to try to find a particular section of DNA. So this is, could be used to identify a particular organism. So if somebody comes into a clinic or something and then they send um, a blood sample or some type of sample to the laboratory, they could then use this process. Or this could be used in a research facility to identify a particular organism or whether or not the DNA that they expect to be in an organism is in there. So we take a single-strand DNA, remember SS DNA, a single-stranded DNA fragment, and then it's going to be complementary to part of the gene that we're looking for. And so then we can use these single-strand um, DNA fragments, and then we can identify where they are within the organism. So... These would be different from other DNA sequences in the sample. So if we have a gene that we're looking for in a particular organism, we would want to get a single-stranded DNA fragment or a probe that is going to match up with a part of that gene that we don't find in other genes, for example. So it needs to be different from other DNA sequences, of course, for diagnosis to be able to identify this. Um, otherwise, it would attach to other genes, and that wouldn't be helpful. <clears throat> we can do this to screen uh, for a sequence of interest within denatured single-stranded DNA. Um, so again, this would be like in the laboratory. If we want to try to figure out if we have a, a gene in there or if we don't, we can use this. And here's how we go about doing this. So at the bottom, I have the illustration from the text. First, we would isolate DNA from the sample. So for example, from the body fluid sample um, or from a culture in a laboratory. Then what we're going to do is we denature the DNA. So denature means to allow those hydrogen bonds to break. So we purposely break those hydrogen bonds. And by denaturing it, we're separating those two DNA strands. So we denature the strands, break those hydrogen bonds. So now we have single-stranded DNA. Then we can combine that 
with our DNA probes. And so our DNA probes are synthesized chemically, so you can purchase them from different um, companies that sell DNA probes, or they can be created in the laboratory. So if you're looking for a particular one, it can be created in the lab. Oftentimes people are going to synthesize them chemically or, or purchase them. So these DNA probes have a molecular tag on them, or they call it down here a molecular beacon. So they're labeled with something. So in this case, it's just kind of a general star saying that it's labeled. But for the molecular tag, it could be a radioactive, radioactive phosphorus atom. So then we can use radiography to see where the DNA is, where it's matching up. We can see the probe. Or oftentimes what's used is a fluorescent dye. And we see this in fish, which is fluorescent, fluorescent in situ hybridization. We'll talk about that in more detail as well. So we have these DNA probes. Oftentimes we, they have a fluorescent dye attached to them. Um, and then you purchase them from a company that makes these things. You get them in the laboratory. You take your DNA sample. You denature it. Typically you do that by heating it up. <clears throat> it gets denatured. And then that's mixed with the DNA probes. Then those DNA probes are going to anneal to the gene of interest. So something that is complementary to it, it's going to match up with it. So then what we can do, depending on the type of molecular tag, is we can identify if that's in our DNA. So if it's a fluorescent dye, then we can apply maybe UV light, depending on the fluorescence, and we can see if it fluoresces or not. Or here, we can check if it has the, that phosphorus atom on there, and we can see if it's there. And we can identify if it actually did match up, because we can wash away all of the remaining DNA probes, and we can find that this is actually attached to the DNA, and then we know that it's in there. <clears throat> so another technique, a technique that is very widely used is the following. So we'll start here with our agrose gel electrophoresis, and then it kind of continues on throughout the process. So these are kind of different pieces of the process that all end up being put together to uh, a longer process. So first let's take a look at what agrose gel electrophoresis is. So this is simply used to separate either DNA or RNA, and that is based on its size. The way this works is you can kind of see here, they're showing that there is a box and then there's an agrose buffer solution that is poured in this box. Then a gel is made. The gel is made with agrose gel. That's why it's called agrose gel electrophoresis. This gel is made, it's allowed to solidify, but when it does, then a comb is placed in there. So before it solidifies, while it's still liquidy, like the agar that we see in, in Petri dishes, <clears throat> the comb is in there that make little wells in the gel. So we have our tray that has a buffer solution in it. Then we place our gel, our agrose gel, into that plate. So we put both of those things together, except now we've taken the comb out. And now we have these wells. And these are our sample wells. So then we have our DNA samples that we are going to apply. And when we apply our DNA samples, what we've already done here is we've already turned them into fragments. So in order to find different sections, what we'll do is we'll take the DNA and then we combine it in a little microcentrifuge tube with our restriction enzymes. And we allow the restriction enzymes to chop up the DNA, cut it up into pieces. And again, this is like we spoke about earlier in chapter 12.1, it cuts in certain places. So if we use a particular restriction enzyme, it cuts the DNA in those places throughout the entire DNA. So then what we end up with are chunks of DNA or fragments of DNA. So then what we can do is we can place this cut up DNA into one of the wells. So the DNA samples are actually mixed with a colored solution, and that's so that we can watch it moving in the gel. So up here we can see in number one, an agarose and buffer solution is poured into a plastic tray. The comb is in there, so it'll solidify. The agarose is going to cool and turn into a gel, just like our agar plates. We remove the comb, and now we have the wells. So then we add color 
to the DNA samples. <clears throat> then we pipette those DNA samples into the wells there. So you can see they've done the first one and then they're going to pipette the second and third one. And that's where we would be loading the samples into, um, not into the buffer really, but into the gel. Now, then we have this gel inside of the box <clears throat> and then we are going to put electricity through it. So once we put it in there, we are going to turn the electricity on. It generates this electrical current. The electrical current is going to go through the gel. Over here you can see that the negative electrode is where it's closest to the wells where we've already applied the DNA. And the positive electrode is here on the opposite end. So then when the electricity is going through the gel, we actually have our positive over here. And remember, DNA is negatively charged. Since it's negatively charged, our DNA is actually going to start to migrate toward the positive end. When it does this, it's going to be migrating toward the positive end, and the agarose gel is similar to what I think of as a sponge. <laughs> so if you think of a sponge, and you can think of all of the little tiny holes inside of a sponge, agarose gel is similar to that, where there's all these little tiny holes. So... If you have a fragment of DNA that's very, very tiny, just a couple of nucleotides or you know a couple of dozen nucleotides, it's going to be pulled through that sponge or through that agarose gel very quickly. So more quickly than a very long strand of DNA that has to try to wind its way through all these little holes in the sponge, um, and it's much bigger, so it's going to be more difficult for it to get through. So all of the DNA is going to go toward the positive end because DNA has a negative charge. And the smaller the molecule is going to travel faster. So you can see in this image here that it's starting to separate out and it's separating out by size. So this band here is going to be a whole bunch of DNA that is quite small versus the bands back here are going to be a bunch of fragmented DNA that's a larger. Once our colored dye gets near the end of the agarose gel, then the electricity is turned off. <laughs> Once the electricity is turned off, then the DNA samples can be compared. Now they're compared to what's called a ladder. So the very first well is always a DNA ladder. And you can see here it's called a ladder because it looks kind of like a ladder with all the different rungs. And the reason that we have a DNA ladder is so that we can compare. So a ladder will look something like this. And when you purchase a ladder, it will tell you the different fragment sizes that it will separate out into. So then you can look and you know, and it has these listed here, the BP is base pairs. So for example, any band that's down here is going to be 250 base pairs, for example. Um, up here, if I can read it, this looks like about 3,000 base pairs. So if we have our ladder, and we know that this band right here is 3,000 base pairs, then we know that in this sample, in well number two, which was our unknown sample, let's say, we have a strand of DNA or fragment of DNA that's about 3,000 base pairs. We also have a strand of DNA here, or fragments of DNA that are about maybe, let's say, 400 base pairs, because we have 500 here and 250 here, maybe something like that in there. So then we can determine what we have here. And you can see in well three, we had different fragments. So we had this restriction enzyme that cuts it up into fragments. And we have these different fragments. And then once we know these different fragments, we can do various things with them. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute. So here, um, just to make sure we covered our bases here, we loaded those samples into our buffer at the negative electrode end. Then we had that ladder there in the first well. Then we run the samples, is what it's called, through that electrical field. The smaller samples travel further toward the positive end because our DNA is negatively charged. <clears throat> it's labeled with ethidium bromide for visualization, so we didn't get to that part yet. Once this gel has gone down like this, the way that we can see the ladder is not because it's purple. The dye that we add up here, the color that we add up here, what that does is it's a molecule in itself and that molecule travels all the way to the end, and it'll end up down here in all of the wells. <clears throat> what that does is it tells us how far the DNA has likely gone. So that is simply a marker to tell us when to shut off the electricity.
So that ends up at the bottom. And then what we have is a gel that just looks totally blank except for the dye all being at the bottom of the gel. And so then what we have to do is we have to label it with thidium bromide and then we can put it on what's called a light box. Um, when you put it on a light box, then it's going to kind of fluoresce. It looks bright like this. Then you can see the ladder, and this is where they put the ladder on both sides. So they put the ladder on the left and on the right. And then in the center here is where we have all of our samples. And so all of the samples in the middle, you can see are at different lengths. And then you can look at the ladder and you can match up these different lengths with the ladder and find out all of the different base pairs. <clears throat> then what we can do is you can cut out those desired fragments and then you can use them in further research. So if you know that the gene of interest that you have is a certain number of base pairs, you can look at the sample, you can see where that, li that lines up with the ladders, and then you can cut out that chunk of gel. Then you can take that chunk of gel and extract the DNA from it and then use that DNA moving forward. There are other things that we can do with the DNA as well. What we just spoke about here, it's utilizing this gel electrophoresis process and applying that to these different situations. And that is <clears throat> restriction fragment length polymorphism analysis. So this is comparing the DNA banding patterns of different DNA samples. So in this case, we're saying we're going to place our samples in the wells. We'll have a, a ladder and we can see where it all separates out. So we've cut the DNA in chunks again. Then we use gel electrophoresis, like we just spoke about, to move those samples, those digested samples. And then, as we just saw, each of those samples will produce different lengths of fragments. <clears throat> now, we can use this to track and identify different organisms in outbreaks of disease. So we can take samples from different um, people that have an illness, we can digest the DNA, we can chop it up into pieces, and we can compare it. <clears throat> Most often what we see here is that we can then determine inheritance patterns. Um, so things like heritable diseases, we can see if a person has a particular um, genetic disease, something that's inheritable, um, and we can do this by utilizing samples of the DNA, and then we can also separate it out. Or in paternity cases. So this is what is used for paternity cases to see if somebody is the father or not, then we can have a sample of the child's, we can have a sample of the uh, possible father, and we can have a sample of the mother, and then we can use those restriction fragments or those fragments that we see, and we can compare both the mother's DNA and the possible father's DNA to the child's DNA and see if they all match up. We can also do this in regards to forensic science. So using this as you would, like, if you went to a crime scene and there was blood at the crime scene, those samples of blood that they pick up can be, can go through this RFLP, and then when that happens, they can compare it to the possible suspect, for example, um, and or the uh, victim of the crime, for example. So they'll see whose blood it is and then see if they can use that in the case. And that's also done in this way. So they'll cut it up into restriction or they'll use restriction enzymes to cut it up into fragments. They'll compare the DNA found at the crime scene, for example, to the victim's DNA and to other possible suspects' DNA. And that's how we can use um, this restriction fragment length polymorphism analysis. And so this is utilized so what else we can do with this is we can do something called a southern blot. Now we're going to talk about several different blots. Um, we'll talk in a little bit more detail here about the southern blot, however. So for the southern blot, what we will do is we have right here our electrophoresis, right? So we've gone through those steps we already spoke about. We've um, cut up the DNA with our um, endonucleases, our restriction enzymes. Then we've placed it in the well. We've applied the electrodes, then it's moved across the gel, and we now have our fragments. What we can do now that we have our fragments is we can transfer that DNA from the gel to a positively charged membrane. And this is what they're showing in number two here. So we have our hybridization buffer here, 
we apply some filter paper, which is basically used as a wicking mechanism. Um, so our liquid is going to wick up through this filter paper. We have our gel here, and then we have a nylon membrane here that is positively charged. And then we have paper towels over here to act as the other side of the wicking mechanism. So we have the filter paper that's going to be pulling that buffer up, and then the liquid is going to want to get to the paper towels, right? Because if we put liquid next to paper towels, for example, the liquid will get soaked up by the paper towels. And then we have a weight to make sure that it's pushing down so that it'll try to pull up through that gel. So our buffer is going to move through the gel, and as it's moving through the gel to get to the paper towels, it actually drops that DNA on this nylon membrane. Because it's positively charged, the DNA sticks there um, right where it was when it was in the gel. So then we have something that looks like this. And this is our piece of paper now that has all the DNA stuck to it. And then we can go in and we can use it in different ways. So we can use it with a probe, so similar to what we spoke about at the beginning here, where we can take a DNA probe and we can apply it. And then it will have a fluorescent dye. And then we can see the different uh, fluorescent dyes to find out which one of these fragments has whatever it is the probe is looking for. Um, so this is a southern blot, and you should know this in, in detail here, what we just went over. Some other blots are listed here. So um, we have what's called the dot blot, blot, <laughs> dot blot, slot blot, or a spot blot. Um, any of those work for this. This is when the concentrated DNA is applied to a membrane, and it does not include the electrophoresis. So in this case, uh, rather than taking the, um, like cutting up the DNA, putting it in the wells, running it in a gel, and then applying it to the paper, what we're doing in a dot blot is we basically just add the DNA to this membrane. Once it's applied to the membrane, then we add the probe to it. <clears throat> so we add the probe to the, the DNA that's on the membrane, and then it, we wash the membrane, and then we take a look at it. Um, and then we see the intensity of the probe is going to tell us about how much target DNA we have. So this is kind of an estimate, and it's also not something where we can go in and then we can utilize the DNA or um, the part that the probe is attached to. This is, and it's not also, it's not to um, separate out and do things like paternity tests and things like that, because we're simply just applying DNA to the paper or the membrane, and then we're applying the probe, and it just gives us an idea of how much of what we're looking for is in there. So it's really simple um, to get a negative, right? So if we're in a laboratory and we just wanna know if we happen to get the DNA, we could just stick some DNA on the membrane, stick the probe on there, does it fluoresce? No, okay, then we need to move forward knowing that we don't have the DNA then. Or if it does a lot, then we know that information as well. So then the next one is the colony blot. <clears throat> so the colony blot is used to detect it within bacterial colonies, as the name implies. So in this case, it would be something like uh, different colonies are representing different clones. Remember when we talked about the genomic libraries and we have a whole bunch of bacteria, we've cut up all the DNA, we've put it into plasmids, we've put those plasmids in bacteria, and we want to know which bacteria have which plasmids. So we can do that using a colony blot. So what we can do is we can take a membrane and we can stick it onto the Petri dish with all the different colonies. Then we can take it off, we can apply chemicals to lyse the cells, and then we can apply the probe. And so we can have many of these and we can apply probes and um, we can either have many of these and apply different probes um, or more likely we would have different probes that have different, say, fluorescence colors on the probes, and then we can apply all of these different probes to this colony blot, um, to this membrane, and then whichever colonies are going to fluoresce a certain color, we know that that has the gene of interest in it. Um, and then we can take those colonies and we can grow them, and then we know that that's the particular one, or that one has a, a particular sequence of DNA in it. The last one is the northern blot, <clears throat> and this is related to RNA. So note that this is in DNA. The other ones that we spoke about uh, were DNA related. The northern blot is an RNA on a membrane. 
Um, so we can apply the RNA to a membrane, and then it's going to detect the amount of mRNA that was made through gene expression. So similar to when we talked about the cDNA uh, library, or the complementary DNA library, where we were taking a look at the mRNA, and we want to know what the cell is expressing uh, rather than what its DNA includes. In this case, for a northern blot, we would be looking at what a particular cell is expressing. Um, and so we would detect some amount of a particular mRNA that's made through gene expression. So again, we could, for example, look at a cell that is being stressed, and we can look at a cell that's not being stressed, and then we can see what particular mRNA is made by those different types of bacteria, one that's stressed and one that's not stressed. So when we are talking about something like comparing a cancer cell, for example, to a healthy cell or a stressed cell to a healthy cell, we can also do something called a microarray analysis. So this, as it says, is a comparison of gene expression patterns <clears throat> that are between different cell types. Uh, so the image here uh, shows a cancerous cell and a healthy cell, for example. Then the RNA can be isolated from it. So through a series of steps, we can get the RNA from the healthy and cancerous cells. That gives us our mRNA that we can then use with reverse transcriptase to make our cDNA. <clears throat> so again, our complementary DNA expressed in genes. And then what we can do is we can put probes on them. So we can do red fluorescent probes on the cancerous cells. And we can do green fluorescent probes, for example, on the healthy cells. And then we can apply those <clears throat> to this chip. Once they're applied to the chip, then you put that chip into a machine, and then it can read the fluorescence. So it can read um, all of this information on the side that you can't really see very well, but it gives you um, information on each of these little squares. So each of these little squares is going to say what is fluorescing. And so you can see here, actually, the green fluorescing over here, and you can see the red fluorescing over here. And so the green, as they show down here, it's only expressed in healthy cells. The red is only expressed in cancerous cells. And then the kind of yellow is only ex or is expressed in both cancerous and healthy cells. So that gives us some information on what is expressed and what changes in cancer cells versus healthy cells, for example. <clears throat> Another way to take a look at um, an organism's you know, DNA profile, RNA profile, protein profile is through polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So this is very similar to agarose gel electrophoresis, um, but different. So our agarose gel electrophoresis, remember we made that gel and it was kind of like a sponge where we had all those little holes that the DNA moved through. When we do a page, this is actually putting proteins in rather than DNA, and it's moving through polyacrylamide gel instead of agarose gel. Now, the polyacrylamide gel is a very fine gel matrix, and it is run differently than the agarose gel electrophoresis. <clears throat> so we're using proteins, and we are going to separate those proteins, just like we separate the DNA and agarose gel. Um, but you can see here on the right-hand side, it is vertically oriented. So rather than it laying down on the table and then it being applied and it going across there with the DNA, instead we're going to be applying up here in the wells and then it's going to travel down in the gel. So it, what this is going to do is it's going to separate proteins. It's going to separate them in different ways depending on the type of page we're doing. So if we're just doing a regular page up here, uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, it's going to separate these proteins based on their net charge. So again, when we're applying um, charge or electricity, we have our negative side here and our positive side here, and then the proteins are going to travel through the gel, and then we can do this by um, charge, or we can do this by size, so it can be based on size um, when we're talking about SDS page. And then we can see the differences, and it depends on how we do it. So if we do a regular page, it'll be based on charge. So depending on the amount of negative charge on the protein, it'll go to the positively charged electrode faster than something that is less negatively charged. Or if we want to 
do that by protein size to see the different sizes, we can do SDS page. So in SDS page, we're doing a page similarly where we apply the proteins to the wells and then we apply um, the power to it or the electricity to it and it's going to travel down the gel. However, in SDS page, we first denature the proteins. Once we denature the protein, so in page, they're all put together. They're intact proteins. Um, in SDS page, we denature the proteins, make them fall apart. Then we coat them in sodium dodecyl sulfate, which is the SDS part. So we coat them in sodium dodecyl sulfate. And you can see in the image up here, it says the SOS, <coughs> SDS, I'm sorry, SDS denatures proteins and makes them uniformly negative in charge. So you can see that here's our intact protein that we would do in regular page. But then if we apply the SDS, then it's going to make them fall apart, denature them, and then it applies, these are negative charges. So it applies a negative charge surrounding the entire protein. So now when we run the proteins in the gel, it's not going to be separating them based on their charge, right? Because they're all uniformly negatively charged. In this case now, what we can do is we would be running them based on protein size. So the smaller ones are going to run through the gel more quickly than the larger ones, similar to our agarose gel, electrophoresis, where we're separating it by size. Smaller is going to move faster. However, there are different versions of SDS page. So there are some modifications. So we can take a look at charges at various pHs um, and size at various pHs. <clears throat> so it can, it can be changed up depending on specifically what a person is looking for. Um, but again, this is page and PAGE is related to proteins rather than gel elect or agarose gel electrophoresis is related to DNA and, and migrating DNA. So then once these things are moved through the gel, through the polyacrylamide gel in this case, then they're stained with co massy blue or a silver stain, and then it looks something like this. So similar to our agarose gel, but again, these are proteins. We have a ladder. We always apply a ladder there so we can take a look at whatever we're trying to look at, so if it's size or charge, and then we can compare to the latter. Um, and then also we can do similar things like we spoke about with the agarose gel, where you can go in and you can cut out sections or you can add probes and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so when we have been speaking about um, things like the agarose gel electrophoresis, what we have said is we take our DNA we apply it to the wells, and then we run our DNA across the gel. But if we were to just take, let's say, a crime scene sample, if we take a little piece of blood from a crime scene, let's say, or a hair or a nail or whatever it is, because, of course, all of the pieces of our body have our DNA in them, so whatever it is, we can take it and we can bring it to the lab. Now, if we were just to take that, say, spot of blood, for example, and put it in the well and start running that DNA, that amount of DNA that would be in that drop of blood would be so small, we would not be able to detect it. It would be too small. Even if we applied it to a membrane, we probably wouldn't be able to detect um, anything with a probe, uh, with the fluorescence probe, for example, because there's just such a small amount of DNA. <clears throat> So we have a technique called PCR or polymerase chain reaction that is going to assist in amplifying the DNA, meaning that we can take a small amount of DNA, even one single strand of DNA, and we can make millions and millions of copies of it. And we can do this very, very quickly using PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So rapid amplification of a specific DNA sequence, and then what we're doing is we are manipulating DNA replication to do this. <clears throat> so why would we do this? One, I just said, if we get something like from a crime scene, there's not going to be enough DNA in there for us to run it and then compare it to you know victims, suspects, et cetera. Um, and one other reason we would use it is to determine the sequence of nucleotides in a specific region of DNA. So we might want to amplify a region of DNA and then apply it to the gel and run it. Um, or we just want to have more of the DNA for whatever other reason. So, for example, to make 
I guess we'll get there in a minute. So <laughs> determine the sequence of nucleotides. That way we can go in and we can take a look at our nucleotide sequence. Amplify our target region of DNA for cloning into a plasmid. So that's what I was just going to say here. If we think back to our genomic libraries, so we wanted to have lots of DNA and lots of plasmids so that we can get those into the bacteria. So we want to amplify our target DNA. So we want to make lots of copies of these fragments so that we can get them in a plasmid and then we can get them into a cell. Uh, identifying the source of DNA to sample left at a crime scene. I already went over that. Similarly, analyzing samples to determine paternity. Um, so when that happens, people generally just take a, a swab from a cheek. So there aren't going to be enough copies of their DNA in a sample from the cheek, so they amplify it. They make millions of copies so that it can be seen in the gel. Comparing samples of ancient DNA with modern organisms. So this is another one where it's like if we find some something, um, say a mummy or something, we can see if there are any cells or anything that has DNA, and then we can take that DNA and we can amplify it. So likely in that situation, we don't have much, um, so we would need to take that and amplify it, make lots of copies so that we can then compare it. And then determine the presence of difficult to culture or unculturable microorganisms in humans or environmental samples. Um, so within humans, if it's difficult to culture something, or when I think of this, I think of something like those barophiles that we find in the deep sea, right? So we can't bring up those organisms and manipulate them and study them in the laboratory because we can't uh, make that high of a pressure. We can't get down there. Um, but if we can get something down there to get them and bring them back up, even though they die, we can then utilize their DNA. Uh, we might not have much of it though, so we need to amplify it. And then we can use that amplification to then have plenty of DNA to work with and maybe take a look at the different genes that they have or express, you know, doing uh, the reverse. So how do we go about doing PCR then? <clears throat> we're going to go through the steps here and you need to be familiar with these. So again, what we're doing is we're amplifying our DNA and we're doing that through PCR. The machine, like the one that we saw at the very first um, beginning of this chapter, is called a thermal cycler. Uh, that's the PCR machine. So the thermal cycler is a machine that can do PCR, which is really nice because a long time ago people had to do it by hand, but now there's a machine, you just program it, and then it'll do it for you. So you can set it up to do something like 25 to 40 cycles. Uh, you can do as many cycles as you want, but then you start to run out of supplies. So then you can create up to trillions of copies. <clears throat> so plenty of DNA to work with. When we're doing PCR, you use something called TAC polymerase or TAC DNA polymerase. This is a heat stable enzyme, so it comes from Thermus aquaticus, which is a hyperthermophile. Perhaps you remember that from the chapter we went over that. A hyperthermophile from Yellowstone Hot Springs. So, this is an enzyme that it uses to make its DNA, to replicate its DNA. So, we've been able to take that from these organisms and utilize that in PCR because it gets very hot and we want to use something that can withstand that heat and not be denatured. So our steps here, um, when we're taking a look, we have various things that happen. So we have denaturation, annealing, and extension. These are the three steps. And then this happens over and over and over again, depending on how many cycles. So each cycle will contain denaturation, annealing, and extension. And then we have the certain number of cycles that we apply to the sample. So in denaturation, what we're doing is we're denaturing the DNA. Remember, denaturing the DNA is separating the two strands. So we're breaking those hydrogen bonds on purpose, and then we end up with our single-stranded DNA. So our DNA, or our double-stranded DNA, is going to be denatured at 95 degrees C. So first thing, we take our double-stranded DNA, and, and we have all of these things in little tiny microcentrifuge tubes inside of the thermal cycler. So we apply our sample, so let's say the spot of blood from the crime scene. We apply that sample into our microcentrifuge tube. We're going to add some other things that we're going to talk about as well. And then we're going to set it up in the thermocycler. So first it heats it up 
to 95 degrees C that separates the two strands. <clears throat> then the machine is going to go down to about 50 degrees C. Uh, and when it does that, this is going to be the process of annealing that will happen. So when we anneal, remember annealing is when we have that hydrogen bond being made with complementary nucleotides. So we add primers to our mix at the beginning and our primers are going to complementary base pair with a certain section of what we are looking for. So the primers are going to anneal <coughs> to each of the strands. So we have two primers. So our two primers will anneal at about 50 degrees C <coughs> and then we go through extension. So then at extension we increase the temperature to about 72 degrees C, and at 72 degrees C, our DNA polymerase, our TAC polymerase, is going to use that primer as a template, and then it's going to extend that DNA. So it's going to start adding nucleotides to build a second strand of DNA, just like it would normally do in DNA replication. So then at the end of these three steps, what we have are two copies of DNA. And you can see they did it by color here, so you can see that the black is the original strand of DNA on both sides. And then we had our red primer here, or pink primer, that then is going to be elongated or extended using TAC polymerase. And then the green one over here that was then extended using TAC polymerase as well. So now, instead of having one strand, one double strand of DNA, now we have two double strands of DNA. Then it goes through the second cycle. The second cycle, we heat it up again to 95 degrees C. When we heat it up to 95 degrees C, now both of those strands are going to separate, are going to denature. So the black strand from here will be denatured from the red, the green is going to be denatured from this black. So we can see that up here. So if we separate this, <clears throat> here's our black strand, it's going to be denatured, and then we have our green strand is denatured from the black strand. So we denature at 95 degrees C, then we go through annealing by bringing it back down to 50 where our primers are going to attach, then we go through extension at 72 degrees C, and now you can see we have more DNA. So more meaning it duplicates. <clears throat> so now we have four double strands of DNA. And then we can do this over and over and over again. So what that means is that this is going to increase logarithmically. Um, and so we end up with, again, trillions of copies of DNA at the end because each cycle is going to double the number of copies. Now that is the typical PCR process and that is what is most widely used. But there are some modifications. So we have RT-PCR, which is our reverse transcriptase PCR. And then in this case, of course, we use reverse transcriptase to create the cDNA or mRNA. <clears throat> um, so in this case, of course, right, we're going to utilize the mRNA. We can use reverse transcriptase to get the cDNA. Then the cDNA is used as a template for PCR. So we just have that additional step of reverse transcriptase being used because it's coming from the mRNA. Then this is where we can detect whether a specific gene is expressed in a sample. So rather than doing PCR and seeing the different chunks of DNA, um, amplifying the different chunks of DNA, running a gel, things like that, we can work backwards and say, is this any, or is the mRNA that's being made, what, what mRNAs are being made, <clears throat> and that can be amplified and then we can use that information. Then we also have quantitative PCR uh, or qPCR, or also called real-time PCR. And so this uses uh, fluorescence to monitor the increase in the double-stranded DNA as PCR is happening. And so then in this case we have machines that are going to be reading this and taking a look at, and that's why it's called real-time PCR, is that it's looking at it in real time as PCR is happening, as we're duplicating the DNA with each cycle, um, we can see the fluorescence and we can quantify the amount of DNA that's in the original sample. Um, so 
as the machine is picking up the amount of fluorescence, then there can be a calculation or kind of a back calculation to determine how much DNA was in the original sample. All right, so then we also have DNA sequencing. <clears throat> so we can do DNA sequencing utilizing PCR. And so this is actually called, or this is um, a way for us to look at exactly what nuclei, nucleotides are in DNA. So this is how the, gene, the human genome, for example, um, could be sequenced, is through this DNA sequencing and through the chain termination method. <clears throat> So in this case, it's also called these, the dideoxy method or the Sanger DNA sequencing method. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing is we're doing DNA replication of our single-stranded template. And then instead of putting in regular nucleotides, uh, which I guess I didn't generally mention in PCR. So in PCR, we have to put in the TAC polymerase, the enzyme that does the polymerase. But then we also put in the primers that match on either side of our gene of interest. And then we put in individual nucleotides, right? Because if our TAC polymerase is going along and elongating our DNA, it has to be doing that with nucleotides. So when you set up PCR, you add the nucleotides. So you add a whole bunch of nucleotides in there. You add a whole bunch of primers in there to anneal that then can be used with the DNA or with the TAC polymerase. And then you add the TAC polymerase as the enzyme that's going to do the elongating. So in a typical PCR, we would just add regular nucleotides, you know, the ATCG. In our chain termination method for DNA sequencing, we use dideoxy nucleotides, uh, this DDNTP. And what this is is that these are missing this hydroxyl group. And so since they're missing the hydroxyl group, then it's going to terminate, right? Because if we look at our dideoxy versus our deoxy nucleotide, these are our phosphate groups here. So this is the phosphate section here, phosphate group, sugar group, and then this is our nitrogenous base, the phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base. And so then remember when we are building DNA, we have the three prime and the five prime. And when it's building, our deoxynucleotide has this OH group here, the hydroxyl group, which allows it to attach to the next base or you know the next sugar versus our dideoxy nucleotide. <clears throat> our dideoxy nucleotide doesn't have that OH, so it's not able to attach to the next nucleotide. And so then since it's not able to attach to the next nucleotide, it stops attaching, it stops um, extending. What this does is it causes termination. And then typically this dideoxy nucleotide is labeled with a molecular tag, so our radioactive one or a fluorescent dye. And so then what we end up with is a whole bunch of fragments of DNA. And then we can run that on a gel. We can take a look at those fragments, and then we can piece together exactly what nucleotides there are. And then that can give us um, exactly what nucleotides and the order that they're in in that particular organism's genome. Um, because what we end up with is... You know, we start the chain and then it stops because we have a dideoxy nucleotide. Then we have another one and it stops at the next one. And then another one, it stops at the next one. And so if it stops at each new nucleotide, so this is like one extra nucleotide, another extra nucleotide, another extra nucleotide, then we can look at what nucleotides are added each time. And we have trillions of these. And so then we can see which nucleotide is added each time where we have our termination. And then that's going to tell us our order of nucleotides. Here, we can see if our A has a red tag, then this is going to fluoresce red. This would, would be green or something like that. So we can see the size of it, and then we can see the different tags on it. So then uh, we can run our fragments on page gels. So we get different different distances based on termination location. Um, and this is one way that we can do that is with those molecular tags, then we can run them. I said that we can run them on a gel, but we can run them on a page gel, um, which has a different type of gel. Again, that's a more fine gel than the agarose gel. That will then give us our different distances um, based on that termination location, like I was just saying. So using that molecular tag, we can determine which 
nucleotide was incorporated because if we look at each nucleotide, then each nucleotide had a different tag on it. Um, so then as it goes through, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, so then that information is compiled and then is the sequence of the entire DNA template. So here it's just kind of showing the dye-labeled dideoxynucleotides are used. You can see they're kind of showing that same thing where we have um, elongation until a T, I guess, that is a dideoxynucleotide that's labeled with the red. Um, so we can run them and then we can figure out what nucleotides are in the DNA and in what order they are. So then lastly, we have next generation sequencing. So what we just spoke about has been used um, for dozens of years. <clears throat> so that is a little bit more of a simplified method. Um, next generation sequencing is utilizing a computer that's going to identify different bands based on how long they've gone and then their incorporated molecular tag nucleotide. So in this one, um, you can see in the image, it says the following are added to the PCR reaction tube. So we have our template here, we have our primers, and then we have our molecular tags, right? So we have our DDNTPs. Of course, we have DNTPs too, right? So remember, DNTPs are the regular ones, deoxynucleotides, and then we have dideoxynucleotides. And those are going to be the ones with the tags on them, the molecular tags. And so we add our, a whole bunch of regular nucleotides, and then we add a lot of tagged nucleotides, and then we put those into our PCR machine. Then at each location, either a DNTP is added or, and elongation continues, or the DDNTP is added and then stops. And then we have our fragments again. <clears throat> now we have the different fragments with the different um, fluorescence to them. Then we can run them through a capillary gel that looks something like this. And then we have our laser that's going to go through. And then at the detector, we're going to pick up information that gets sent to the computer. So we can use this capillary gel electrophoresis. So we're still pulling the information through the tube. But as we're pulling it through the tube, then we have our spectrophotometer that shoots our wavelengths of laser and it can detect what fragment it is. So it can detect that molecular tag and then it will go onto the computer screen and then you can see which nucleotide it was and that will build the genome for that particular organism. So it maps that DNA sequence just by utilizing this method. And it's much easier um, because the computer kind of does the work for you. All right, so that kind of wraps up our um, chapter 12.2, talking about different ways to visualize or characterize um, things by DNA, RNA, and proteins.